Welcome to Puritan Sermons, Sermon 25, Thomas, by Thomas Watson, entitled, The Day of Judgment Asserted. Because he had a point of the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17, 31. St. Paul, perceiving the idolatry of Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, verse 16. His spirit was soured and embittered in him. Paul was a bitter man against sin. That anger is without sin, which is against sin. Or the word may signify he was in a paroxysm, or a burning fit of zeal. And zeal is such a passion as cannot be dissembled or pent up. With this fire he discharges against their just idolatry. In men of Athens I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I pass by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Verse 22-23 Nor does the apostle only declaim against the false God, but declare to them the true God. And he doth it from the effect that God hath made the world and all things therein, is Lord of heaven and earth, verse 24. To create is the best demonstration of a deity. And this God, being everywhere by way of repletion, Jeremiah 23, 24, cannot be locally confined. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Acts 17, 24. And though in former times, when the veil of ignorance was drawn over the face of the world, God seemed less severe, the times of this ignorance God winked at. He did, as it were, overlook them, not taking the extremity of the law. Yet now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 30. And if it be asked, why now repent? We, why may we not take our full sleep? The reason is because now is broad daylight of the gospel, which is, which as it discovers sin more clearly, so it more clearly discovers judgment upon sinners. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Which words are God's alarm to the world to waken it out of security? This is a sweet yet dreadful point. When St. Paul discoursed of judgment to come, Felix trembled. Acts 24:25. He that is not affected with this truth hath a heart of stone. For the illustration of this, there are six things I shall discuss. One, that there shall be a day of judgment. Two, why there must be a day of judgment. Three, when the day of judgment shall be. Four, who shall be the judge. Five, the order and method of the trial, and six, the effect or consequent of it. One, I begin with the first, that there shall be a day of judgment. There is a twofold day of judgment. One, a particular day, a particular judgment. At the day of death, immediately upon the soul's dissolution from the body, it hath a judgment passed upon it. Hebrews 9.27 Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God that gave it. Ecclesiastes 12.7 As soon as the breath expires, the soul receives its particular sentence, and knows how it shall be with it to all eternity. 2. There is a general day of judgment, which is the greatest sizes, when the world shall be gathered together, and of this the text is to be understood. He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. I might impel a whole jury of scriptures, giving in their verdict to this, but in the mouth of two or three witnesses the truth will be confirmed. God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12.14 Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Matthew 12:36. Now is the day of arrears, then will be the day of account. For he cometh, 
For he cometh to judge the world. Psalm 96, 13. The ingemination denotes the certainty and infallibility of his coming. 2. Why there must be a day of judgment? 1. That God may execute may execute justice on the wicked. Things seem to be carried here in the world with an unequal balance. The candle of God shines upon the wicked. Job 29.3 They that tempt God are even delivered. Malachi 3.15 Diogenes, seeing Harpalus, a thief, go on prosperously, said that surely God had cast off the government of the world and minded not how things went here below. There shall come in the last days scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Therefore God will have a day of assizes to vindicate his justice. He will let sinners know that long forbearance is no forgiveness. 2. That God may exercise mercy to the godly. Here piety was the white which was shot at. They who prayed and wept had the hardest measure. Those Christians whose zeal did flame most met with a fiery trial. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Romans 8.36 The saints, as Cyprian saith, are put in the winepress, and off the blood of these grapes is pressed out. God will therefore have a day of judgment, that he may reward all the tears and sufferings of his people. They shall have their crown and throne and white robes. Revelation 7.9 Though they may be losers for him, they shall lose nothing by him. 3. When the day of judgment shall be. It is certain there shall be a judgment. Uncertain when. The angels know not the day, nor Christ, neither as he was man. Matthew 24, 36, and Mark 13, 32. And the reason why the time is not known is, one, that we may not be curious. There are some things which God would have us ignorant of. It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Acts 1, 7. We must not pry into God's ark or into meddle with his secrets of government. It is a sign of sacrilege, as Salvian speaks, for any man to break into the Holy of Holies and enter into God's secrets. 2. God hath concealed the time of judgment that we may not be careless. We are always a good sentinel, having our loins dirt and our lamps burning, not knowing how soon that day may overtake us. God would have us live every day, said Austin, as if the last day were approaching. This is the genuine news which our Saviour makes of it. Of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Mark 13, 32, 33. But though we cannot tell precisely when this day of the Lord shall be, Yet in probability, the time cannot be far off. He that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Hebrews 10.37 Chrysostom hath a simile. When, saith he, we see an old man going on crutches, his joints, joints weak, his radical moisture dried up. Though we do not know the just time when he will die, yet it is sure he cannot live long, because nature's stock is spent. So the world is decrepit and goes, as it were, upon crutches. Therefore, it cannot be long before the world's funerals and the birthday of judgment. The age which St. John wrote in was the last time, 1 John 2.18. In the Greek, it is eskate all ora, the last hour. Then surely the time we now live in may be called the last minute. For he cometh to judge the earth, Psalm 96.13 Not he shall come, but he cometh, to show how near the time is. It is almost daybreak, and the court is ready to sit. The judge standeth at the door. 
James 5.9 Verily, if security, apostasy, decay of love, inundation of sin, revelation of Antichrist, be made in scripture the symptoms and prognostics of the last day, Matthew 24, 37-39, and 1 Timothy 4, 1, and Matthew 24, 12, 2 Timothy 3, 1-5, and 1 John 2, 18. We have these very grey hairs among us. The day of judgment cannot be far off. 4. Who shall be the judge? I answer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus it is in the text. He will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained, that man who is God-man. We must take heed of judging others. This is Christ's work. The Father hath committed all judgment unto the Son. John 5.22 he who once had a reed put into his hand, his father will now put a scepter into his hand. He who had a purple robe put into him in derision shall come in his judge's robes. He who, was, who hung upon the cross shall sit upon the bench. There are two things in Christ which do eminently qualify him for a judge. One, sagittatus, prudence and intelligence to understand all quarters that are brought before him. He is, he is described with seven eyes in Zechariah 3.9 to note his omnipotency, omnisciency, Hebrews 4.13. He is like Ezekiel's wheels, full of eyes, Ezekiel 10.12. Christ is a heart searcher. He doth not only judge the fact, but the heart, which no angel can do. Two, strength, whereby he is able to be revenged upon his enemies. Christ is armed with sovereignty, therefore the seven eyes are made to be upon one stone, Zechariah 3.9, to denote the infinite strength of Christ, and he is destroyed with seven horns, Revelation 5.6. As Christ hath an eye to see, so he hath a horn to push. As he hath his balance, so he hath his sword. As he hath his fan and his sieve, so he hath his lake of fire. Revelation 20, 10, 5. The order and method of the trial, where, observe one, the summons. Two, the judges coming to the bench. Three, the process and trial itself. One, the summons to the court. And that is by the sounding of a trumpet. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. St. Jerome saith that where, whatever he was doing, he thought he heard the noise of this trumpet sounding in his ears. Arise, ye dead, and come to judgment. Note 1. The shrillness of the trumpet. It shall sound so loud that the dead shall hear it. 2. The efficacy of the trumpet. It shall not only startle the dead, but raise them out of their graves. Matthew 24:31. They who will not hear the trumpet of the ministry sounding, but lie in sin, shall be sure to hear the trumpet of the archangel sounding. To the manner of the judge, judges coming to the bench, Christ coming to the judgment will be glorious, yet dreadful. One. It will be glorious to the godly. The apostle calls it the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 2. Christ's person shall be glorious. His first coming in the flesh was obscure. His glory was veiled over. Isaiah 53.2-3 All who saw the man did not see the Messiah. But his second coming will be in very... will be very illustrious and resplendent. He shall come in the glory of his Father, Mark 8:38. That is, he shall wear the same embroidered robes of majesty as his Father. 2. Christ's attendants shall be glorious. He shall come with all his holy angels, Matthew 25:31. 
these sublime seraphic spirits, who for their luster are compared to lightning, Matthew 28.3, are part of Christ's train and retinue. He who was led to the cross with a band of soldiers shall be attended to the bench with a guard of angels. 2. Christ coming to judgment will be dreadful to the wicked. At the coming of his judge, there will be a fire burning round about him. He shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that know, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 8. When God did give his law upon the mount, there were thunders and lightnings, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Exodus 19, 16, 18. If God was so terrible at the giving of the law, oh, how terrible will he be when he, he shall come to require his law. 3. The process or the trial itself. Where, observe 1, the universality, and 2, the formality, and 3, the circumstances of the trial. 1. The universality of the trial. It will be a very great assizes, never was the like seen, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Kings and nobles, councils and armies, those who were above all trial here, have no charter of exemption granted them. They must appear before Christ's tribunal and be tried for their lives. Neither power nor policy can be a subterfuge. They who refuse to come to the throne of grace, Hebrews 4.16, shall be forced to come to the bar of justice. And the dead, as well as the living, must make their appearance. I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. Revelation 20.12 We do not use to cite men to our courts when they are dead. But at that day, the dead are called to the bar, and not only men, but angels, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness unto the judgment of a great day. Jude 6. 2. The formality of the trial, which consists in the opening of the book, the judgment was set, and the books were opened, Daniel 7.10 and Revelation 20.12. There are two books that will be opened. 1. The book of God's omnisciency. God not only observes, but registers all our actions. Thou numberest my steps, Job 14.16. The word there, to number, signifies to put a thing into the book. As if Job had said, Lord, thou keepest thy day book, and enterest down all my actions into the book. We read of God's book of remembrance, Malachi 3.16. This book will be produced at the last day. 2. The book of conscience. Let there never be so much written in a book, yet if it be classed, it is not seen. Men have their sins written in their conscience, but the book is clasped. The searing of the conscience is the clasping of the book. But when this book of conscience shall be unclasped at the great day, then all their hypocrisy, treason, atheism, shall appear to the view of men angels. Luke 12.3 The sins of men shall be written upon their forehead as with a pen of iron. 3. The circumstances of the trial, where consider four things. One, the impartiality. Two, the exactness. Three, the perspicuity. And four, the supremacy. One, the impartiality of the trial. Jesus Christ will do every man justice. He will, as the text says, judge the world in righteousness. It will be a day of equitable judgment. Justice holds the scales. The Thebans did picture their judges blind and without hands. 
blind that they might not respect persons, without hands that they might take no bribes. Christ's scepter is a scepter of righteousness, Hebrews 1.8. He is no respecter of persons, Acts 10.34. He is not nearness of blood, it is not nearness of blood prevails, many of Christ's kindred will be condemned. It is not gloriousness of profession, many shall go into hell with Christ in their mouths. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Matthew 7.22 Yet though they cast out devils, they are cast out to the devil. It is not the varnish of a picture that a judicious eye is taken with, but the curiousness of the work. It is not the most shining profession which Christ is taken with, unless you see the curious workmanship of grace in the heart, drawn by a pencil of the Holy Ghost. Things are not carried there by parties, but in a most just balance. Christ had true weights for false hearts. There are no fees taken in that court. The judge will not be bribed with a hypocritical tear or a Judas kiss. 2. The exactness of the trial. It will be very critical. Then will Christ thoroughly purge his floor. Matthew 3.12 Not a grace or a sin, but his fan will discover. Christ will at the day of judgment make a heart anatomy. As a surgeon makes a dissection in the body and does criticize upon the several parts, or as a goldsmith bring his gold to the balance and touchstone and pierce his gold through to see if it be right and genuine, and whether there be not a baser metal within, thus the Lord Jesus, whose eyes are as a flame of fire, Revelation 1.14 will pierce through the hearts of men and see if there be the right metal within having the image and superscription of God upon it. Paint falls off before the fire. The hypocrite's paint will fall off at the fiery trial. Nothing then will stand us instead but sincerity. 3. The purposeity of the trial. Sinners shall be so clearly convicted that they shall hold up their hand at the bar and cry, Guilty. Those words of David must be fitly applied here, that thou mightest be clear when thou judgest. Psalm 51.4 The sinner himself shall clear God of injustice. The Greek word for vengeance, decay, signifies justice. God's taking vengeance is doing justice. Sin makes God angry, but it cannot make him unrighteous. The wicked shall drink a sea of wrath, but not sip one drop of injustice. Christ will say, Sinner, what apology canst thou make for thyself? Are not thy sins written in the book of conscience? Hast thou not that book in thy own keeping? Who could interline it? Now the sinner, being self-condemned, shall clear his judge. Lord, though I be damned, yet I have no wrong done me. Thou art clear when thou judgest. 4. The supremacy of a court. This is the highest court of judicature, from whence whence is no appeal. Men can remove their causes from one place to another, from the common law to the court of chancery, but from Christ's court there is no appeal. He who is once doomed here, his condition is irreversible. 6. The sixth and last particular is the effect or consequence of the trial, which consists in three things. 1. Segregation. Christ will separate the godly and the wicked. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, 32. Then will be the great day of separation. It is a great grief to the godly in this life that they live among the wicked. Woe is me, that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedah. Psalm 120, verse 5. Wicked men blaspheme God. Psalm 74, 18. Persecute the saints. 2 Timothy 3, 12. They are compared to dogs. Psalm 22, 16. To bulls. 
Psalm 68.30 to Lions 58.4 They roar upon the godly and tear them as their prey. Cain kills. Ismael mocks. Shimei rails. The godly and the wicked are now promiscuously mingled together. Matthew 13.30 And this is as offensive as the tying of a dead man to a living. But Christ will ere long make a separation, as a fan does separate the wheat from the char, as a furnace separates the gold from the dross, or as a searcher strains out the spirits from the, the dregs. Christ will put the sheep by themselves, who have the earmark of election upon them, and the goats by themselves, after which separation there follows. Two, the sentence, which is twofold. One, the sentence of absolution pronounced upon the godly. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34. After the pronouncing of which blessed sentence, the godly shall go from the bar and sit upon the bench with Christ. Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? 1 Corinthians 6, 2. The saints shall be Christ's assessors. They shall sit with him in judicature, as the justices of peace with the judge. They shall vote with Christ, and applaud him in all his judicial proceedings. Here the world does judge the saints, but there the saints shall judge the world. 2. The sentence of condemnation pronounced upon the wicked Depart from ye, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. I may allude to that in James 3:10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Out of the same mouth of Christ proceeds blessing to the godly and cursing to the wicked. The same wind which brings one ship to the haven blows another ship upon the rock. Depart from me. The wicked once said to God, Depart. They said to God, Depart from us. Job 21.14 And now God will say to them, Depart from me. This will be a heart-rending word. Chrysostom says, This word, Depart, is worse than the fire. Depart from me, in whose presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16.11 3. After this sentence follows the execution, bind the tares in the bundles to burn them. Matthew 13, 30. Christ will say, bundle up these sinners. Here a bundle of hypocrites, there a bundle of apostates, there a bundle of profane. Bundle them up and throw them in the fire. And now no cries or entreaties will prevail with the judge. The sinner and the fire must keep one another company. He who would not wait for his sins must burn for them. And it is everlasting fire. The three children were thrown into the fire, but they did not stay in long. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Daniel 3.26 but the fire of the damned is everlasting. This word ever breaks the heart. Length of time cannot terminate it. A, tea, a sea of tears cannot quench it. The wrath of God is a fire, and the breath of God is the bellows to blow it up to all eternity. Oh, how dreadfully tormenting will this fire be. To endure it will be intolerable. To avoid it will be impossible. Uses Use 1. Let me persuade all Christians to believe this truth, that there shall be a day of judgment. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know, though, that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9 This is a great article of our faith that Christ shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
Yet how many live as if this article were blotted out of their creed? We have too many epicures and atheists who drown themselves in sensual delights and live as if they did not believe either God or the Day of Judgment. The Lucianists and Platonists deny the immortality of the soul. The Potaninians hold there is no hell. I have read of the Duke of Cilicia. He was so infatuated that he did not believe either God or devil. I wish there be not too many of this Duke's opinion. Durst men swear, be unchaste, live in malice, if they did believe a day of judgment? O oh, mingle this text with faith. The Lord hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world. There must be such a day. Not only does scripture assert it, but reason confirms it. There is no kingdom or nation in the world but have their sessions and courts of judicature. And God who sets up all other courts, shall not he be allowed his? That there shall be a day of judgment is engrafted by nature in the consciences of men. Peter Martyr tells us that some of the heathen poets have written that there are certain judges appointed, minus Radamanthus and others, to examine and punish offenders after this life. Bruce 2. See here the sad and deplorable state of wicked men. This text is as the handwriting on the wall, which may make their knees to smite one against another. Daniel 5, 6. The wicked shall come to judgment, but they shall not stand in judgment. Psalm 1, 5. In the Hebrew, it is, they shall not rise up. When God shall be decked with glory and majesty, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, and a sword of justice in his hand, and shall call the sinner by name and say, Stand forth, answer to the charge that is brought against thee. What canst thou say for thy pride, oaths, drunkenness, etc.? These sins thou hast been told of by my ministers, whom I sent, rising up early, Jeremiah 7.25, and going to bed late. But thou just persist in thy wickedness, with a neck of iron, a brow of brass, Isaiah 48.4, a heart of stone, Ezekiel 36.26, all the tools which I wrought with were broken and worn out upon thy rocky spirit. What canst thou say for thyself that the sentence should not pass? Oh, how amazed and confounded will the sinner be! He will be found speechless. He will not be able to look his judge in the face. What then shall I do when God rises up? And when he visiteth, what shall I answer him? Job 31, 14. O wretch, thou, art, thou, canst not, thou canst now outface thy minister and thy godly parents when they tell thee of sin. Thou shalt not be able to outface thy judge. When God rises up, the sinner's countenance will be fallen. Genesis 4, 6. And when he visiteth, visiteth what shall I answer him? Not many years since, the bishops did used to visit in their diocese and call several persons before them as criminal. All the world is God's diocese, and shortly he is coming on his visitation and will call men to account. Now when God shall visit, how shall the impure soul be able to answer him? Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 1 Peter 4, 18 Thou that diest in thy sin art sure to be cast at the bar. He that believeth not is condemned already. John 3, 18 That is, he is as sure to be condemned as if he were condemned already. And if once the sentence of damnation is passed, miserable man, what wilt thou do? Whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou seek help from God? He is a consuming fire. Wilt thou seek help from the world? It will all it will be all on fire about thee. From the saints, those thou didst deride upon earth, from the good angels, they defy thee as God's enemy. From the bad angels, they are thine executioners. From thy conscience, there is the worm that gnaws. From mercy, the lease is run out. O oh, the horror and hellish despair, which will seize upon sinners at that day. O oh, the sad convulsions, their heads shall hang down, their cheeks blush, their lips quiver, 
their hands shake, their conscience roar, their heart tremble. What stupefying physic hath the devil given to men, that they are insensible of the danger which they are in? The cares of the world have so filled their head, and the profits of it have so bewitched their heart, that they mind neither death nor judgment. Use 3. Exhortation. Branch 1. Possess yourselves with the thoughts of the day of judgment. Think of the solemnity and impartiality of this court. Feathers swim upon the water, gold sinks into it, light feathery spirits float in vanity, but serious Christians sink deep in the thoughts of judgment. Many people are like quicksilver, they cannot be made to fix. If the ship be not well ballasted, it will soon overturn. The reason why so many are overturned with the vanities of the world is because they are not well ballasted with the thoughts of the day of judgment. Were a man to be tried for his life, he would bethink himself of all the arguments he could to plead in his own defence. We are all shortly to be tried for our souls. While others are thinking how they may grow rich, let us bethink ourselves how we may abide the day of Christ's coming. Malachi 3.2 the serious thoughts of judgment would be, 1. A curbing bit to sin. Am I stealing the forbidden fruit and the assizes so near? 2. A, spare, a spur to holiness. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? 2 Peter 3, 10, 11. Branch 2. Let us solemnly prepare ourselves for, the list, for this last and great trial. That is, by setting up a judgment seat in our own souls, let us begin a private sessions before the assizes. It is wisdom to bring our souls first to trial. Let us search and try our ways. Lamentation 3.40 Let us judge ourselves according to the rule of the word and let conscience bring in the verdict. The word of God gives several characters of a man that shall be absolved in the day of judgment and is sure to go to heaven. Character 1 The first character is humility. The Lord shall save the humble person. Job 22, 29. Now let conscience bring in the verdict. Christian, art thou humble? Not only humbled, but humble. Dost thou esteem others better than thyself? Philippians 3, 3, 2, 3. Dost thou cover thy duties with a veil of humility, as Moses put on a veil on his face when it shined? If conscience brings in this verdict, they are sure to be acquitted in the last, at the last day. Character 3, 2. Love to the saints. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. 1 John 3, 14. Love makes us like God. 1 John 4, 19. It is the root of all the graces. Do conscience witnesses for you? Are you perfumed with this sweet spice of love? Do you delight in those who have the image of God? Do you reverence their graces? Do you bear with their infirmities? Do you love to see Christ's picture in a saint, though hung in never so poor a frame? This is a good sign that thou shalt pass for current at the day of judgment. Character 3 A penitential frame of heart. Repentance unto life. Acts 11.18 Repentance unravels sin, and makes it not to be. In those days the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. Jeremiah, 1, uh, Jeremiah 50, 20 A great ball of snow is melted and washed away with the rain. Great sins are washed away by holy tears. Now can conscience bring in the evidence for thee. Dost thou tune the penitential string? Thou hast sinned with Peter. Dost thou weep with Peter? And do thy tears drop from the eye of faith? This is a blessed sign that thou art judgment proof, and that when thy iniquities shall be sought for at the last day, they shall not be found. 
Character 4. Equity in our dealings. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands. Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Injustice does sully and defile the hand. What saith the conscience? Is thy hand clean? Is it a vain thing to hold the Bible in one hand and false weights in the other? Beloved, if conscience upon a scriptural trial give in the verdict for us, it is a blessed sign that we shall lift up our heads with boldness at the last day. Conscience is God's echo in the soul. The voice of conscience is the voice of God. And if conscience upon an impartial trial doth acquit us, God will acquit us. If our heart condemn us not, then have we con- confidence towards God. 1 John 3.21 If we are absolved in the lower court of conscience, we are sure to be absolved at the last day in the high court of justice. It were a sweet thing for a Christian thus to bring himself to a trial. Seneca tells us of the Roman, who every day called himself to account. What infirmity is healed? Wherein art thou grown better? Then he would lie down at night with these words, Oh, how sweet and refreshing is my sleep to me. Use 4. Consolation. Here is a fountain of consolation open to a believer. And that in three cases. In case of 1. Discouraging fear. 2. Weakness of grace. Or 3. Censures of the world. Case 1. Here is comfort in case of discouraging fear. O, saith the believer, I fear my grace is not armour of proof. I fear the cause will go against me at the last day. Indeed, so it would, if thou wert out of Christ. But as in our law courts the client hath his attorney to advocate to plead for him, so every believer, by virtue of the interest, hath Christ to plead his cause for him. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1. What, though Satan be the accuser, if Christ be the advocate? Christ never lost any cause that he pleaded. Nay, his very pleading alters the nature of the cause. Christ will show the debt book crossed with his own blood. And it is no matter what is charged, if all be discharged. Here is a believer's comfort. His judge will be his advocate. Case 2. Here is comfort in regard of weakness of grace. A Christian, seeing his grace so defective, is ready to be discouraged. But at the day of judgment, if Christ find but a drachm of sincerity, it shall be accepted. If thine be true gold, though it may be light, Christ will put his merits into the scales and make it pass current. He that hath no sin of allowance shall have grains of allowance. I may allude to that in Amos 9.9, yet shall not the least grain fall to the earth. (coughs) He that hath but a grain of grace, not the least grain shall fall to hell. Case 3. It is comfort in case of censures and slanders. The saints go here through strange reports, through evil reports, and good report. 2 Corinthians 6, 8. John Baptist's head in a charger is a common dish nowadays. It is ordinary to bring in a saint beheaded of his good name. But at the day of judgment, Christ will unload his people of all their injuries. He will vindicate them from all their calumnies. Christ will be the saint's compurgator. He at that day will present his church, not having spot or wrinkle. Ephesians 5.27 This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. 
Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reform books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important when he says that God had commanded no such thing and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.